Good morning and welcome to this Monday, November 14th, 2022 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes, featuring everything you need to know as you prepare for the trading day ahead. Uh, let's see, currently we've got uh, futures. Um, well, they were down earlier, but now I'm, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, we're showing futures. Again, this is just a little bit of delay, but I've shown futures down uh, 53 on the Dow. Uh, 13 on the S&P 500, NASDAQ futures down a little bit more, down about 70 uh, points. Crude oil down a little bit more than 1%. It's back under $88 a barrel. And the 10-year Treasury yield, which took a tumble at the end of last week, is back up four basis points to 3.87%. So that's where we are right now as we try to kick off a new week. Um, we're just about to go into the second half of November. One interesting historical fact if you follow the market, and especially if you've been following earnings beats for a while, you know that the performance of the stock market in the first half of calendar quarters tends to be very strong. And the second half of calendar quarters tends to be very weak, relatively speaking. And what I mean by that is literally the performance, if we look at the first quarter, January, for, well, actually January 2nd, since first we're always closed, but January 2nd, to February 15th tends to be very strong. February 16th to March 31st tends to be much weaker. Same goes for the second and third quarters. First half of the second quarter, April 1st to May 15th tends to be strong. May 16th to June 30th, not so much. Go into the third quarter, July 1 to August 15. We saw it beautifully this year. My gosh, couldn't have been uh, crafted out any, any uh, a better for an illustration. But from uh, July 1st to August 15th, we tend to be very strong. August 15th, to September 30th uh, is the worst half of any quarter by far. Uh, so we always have to be careful then. And this was a really rough one this year, for sure. And then you go into the fourth quarter and it's different. Both halves of the quarter are strong. I think, um, and I'm doing this off memory, but I believe the second half actually has an annualized return that's higher than the first half. And I think there's a couple of reasons for it. Number one, I think it's the holiday spirit. Uh, I think that's part of it. But I think maybe a, even a bigger part of it is that most companies, when you get to the uh, end of September, I always, you know, September is the worst month of the year for a reason. And I think companies that are really struggling tend to just throw all their dirty laundry into September. I mean, if they get to the third quarter and they still are underperforming or not meeting expectations they're probably just going to throw in the towel and say, listen, we're just going to take everything that's bad out there and just throw it in. Let's just wash everything through and let's start anew because we're not coming back this year. The rest of this year is not going to be good. So I think that um, I always call September the dirty laundry month. I just think that companies, if they have it, they're going to probably get rid of it in September. And so I think that's part of it too. Uh, you know, you don't go into the end of the year with too many warnings. It's like anybody who is warning or really worried about the year already talked about it in September, got it out of the way. And normally when you're going into the end of the year, you're very optimistic about next year. And I think that's part of it. I think that the market, you've got a lot of vacations because of the holidays. I think the volume is lighter. Volume, volume is definitely lighter around the Christmas holidays. And I think it's easier to mani manipulate prices. If you're a market maker, um, you know, there's not as much capital out there other than yours to move prices. So I think it is easier to manip manipulate. Anyhow, do with it what you want. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. The second half of the fourth quarter is as strong as the first half. I think it's actually a little bit stronger than the first half. And that is unlike the other three quarters, completely unlike how the other three quarters and I just mentioned this because it's November 14th. We're getting ready to go into that second half of the quarter. And I just want to make sure, because I talk about the second half of the quarter sometimes not being very strong. I just want to make sure you're aware. Second half of the fourth quarter, there's no let up in the bullish action historically. Do we go down sometimes in the second half of the fourth quarter? Yes. This is no guarantee. We're talking about tendencies, probabilities. That's what I'm talking about with the, uh, the second half, the fourth quarter. Anyhow, just wanted to mention that. Let's go ahead and get started here. Got some interesting stuff to go over. 
So we're going to start off first with uh, our home at earningsbeats.com. If you are unfamiliar with it, you might check it out sometime. Go over to earningsbeats.com. A couple of things. Number one, free newsletter. We try to educate. Uh, I think we do a really good job of providing a lot of education. A lot of it's free. And this is a big piece of it. Our Earnings Beats Digest. Today, uh, I thought it was a really good article um, for you to think about with some of the changes taking place in the market right now. Uh, we've got a big um, day coming up on Thursday. That's our quarterly portfolio draft. That's where we draft the individual stocks into our portfolios to try to outperform the S&P 500. When you look over here and you see a history of success, um, it's because of the way we approach the market, I believe. I think looking at the market each quarter, looking at what's working, what's not working, what we think is likely to work, and then building a portfolio around that to try to beat the S&P 500. I think this we've been pretty successful at doing that. And uh, that's coming up on Thursday. Now, in order to attend that one, that is a, that's for our members. You got to be a member for that one. Um, but we do have a free trial. You can always go in, start a 30-day free trial. This is a great time to do it. And I'll give you another reason in just a minute. But our Earnings Beats Digest is our free newsletter three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Uh, love to have you come on board, check it out. Um, we really try to focus on things that are important to us, the earnings, relative strength, candlesticks, price volume, moving averages, trend lines. Um, we'll feature individual stocks. We'll feature industry groups. We feature the major indices. We talk sentiment. We do all kinds of different things. It's free. No credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. Name an email address. Uh, check that out. Make sure you are part of that. Also, any free events that we do, we reach out to the Earnings Beats Digest community and offer up room instructions for you to join. So it's another reason to be part of it uh, so you don't miss out on any of the free events that we have. Um, so I mentioned this is a great week to try us out. And the reason is this is our fall special. We started on Saturday. This is our best deal of the year. The more you like us, the more you want to commit, the more you're going to save. And so you can go in, you can click on this. This is running for the next two weeks. So you got two weeks to uh, check us out, which is why I think starting a trial now is a great time. Because if you go over the next couple of weeks, you go through the draft, you look at all the daily market reports, all the research we do, the guidance we provide, um, it'll give you an opportunity at no cost to see if you like our service. If you don't like our service, listen, that's fine. We're not for everybody. You may not like my style. That's fine. You know, not going to hurt my feelings, but it may also change the way that you invest for the rest of your life. And it may change the way you teach your kids and grandkids how to invest. So check it out for free. And then if you like it over the next two weeks, you'll have an opportunity to take advantage of our fall special, which is there. You will not find a better opportunity to join our service than what we offer at the, in our fall special. So be sure to check it out. Now, one question that comes up a lot, I always wanna mention this. Okay, it's a 30 day free trial, but we only have two weeks to act on this offer. What happens to the remaining two weeks of our trial if we like the service and we decide to extend? Do we lose our trial? The answer is no. You will continue to get your free trial. Whatever you sign up for will be added to the end of your trial period. You're not losing any time. You're not gonna get gypped out of your two weeks of your trial. Check us out. Come to the event this Thursday. We talk about a lot more than just picking stocks. We talk about the themes in the market, um, what's taking place. And right now, there's a lot taking place. This is a this is going to be a one of the bigger events, <clears throat> one of our biggest drafts in, in a while. So please make sure you check this out. All right, let's move on. What happened on Friday? Really, what happened on Thursday and Friday? But I just have Friday here up on the screen to go over. Dow Jones was up 32. S&P was up 36. NASDAQ up 209. So on a percentage basis, clearly, NASDAQ big winner. Mid caps up 14 points. Small caps up 7 points. So clearly, when you look across the major indices, the NASDAQ, which was up almost 2%, swamped the other indices. And did the same thing on Thursday as well with that massive update that we saw. All of a sudden, things have completely changed on the charts. I mean, we're technically driven. We're also very fundamentally driven. We got, 
we're historically driven. Uh, I'm sentiment driven, but at the same time, you know, it really comes down to price volume. That's number one. And I want to stress that on a couple of different occasions today, because I'm going to go over uh, something that's been a question among a lot of our members and probably a lot of non-members, probably people listening to the show. I want to try and clear something up, but it's really important that you understand things have changed here over the last two days. Just the way the charts are set up. You've got the Dow already strong. Now, on a relative basis, yeah, the Dow didn't do as well Thursday and Friday, but the Dow was already, had already had a huge October, was up again in November. And so money is just simply rotating away from the Dow right now. But it's still very strong, still looks great. PPO looks good. AD line getting ready to break out. You're trading above the 20, which is above the 50. What's not the like other than clearing overhead price resistance? And that's going to be, that's going to be the challenge from here through the end of the year and into next year, taking these overhead resistance areas one at a time. It's not going to be straight up. I really don't think it's going to be straight up. I think we'll go up. We'll hit some key levels. We'll pull back. And I'm, I'm actually more concerned about the pullbacks and whether they hold support than I am about the overhead resistance. Because as long as support keeps holding and we keep moving up, it's just a matter of time before resistance levels go. Um, S&P 500, though, broke out above that late October high. Also, Golden Cross, the 20 now, back up above the 50. So that has joined the Dow Jones. NASDAQ, good news is we had kind of this weird bottoming head and shoulder pattern, left shoulder, neckline, head, neckline, right shoulder dipped way below the left, but never took out the head. So we still had just like this unbalanced bottoming head and shoulder pattern. Well, guess what? The neckline went last week. We took that out to the upside. PPO looking to cross above the center line, not quite there yet. And the 20 day moving average moving up, but we haven't seen that golden cross yet. So on a relative basis, the NASDAQ has been the underperformer. I mean, you could just look at October. Look at the Dow going up in October, the S&P ending up above the early part of October. Look at the NASDAQ, couldn't take out the early part of October. And by the end of October, wasn't that much higher than where we were at the end of September. Certainly not relative to what the Dow was doing. So that was our, our weak area. Thursday and Friday may have been a big, 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 big game changer. And I say may have simply because we've got to wait and see what, kind, what we get on pullbacks. Do we hold? I think we're going to. I think this was a huge breakout. I think the market's been waiting for this. I think we've gotten that one report on inflation. The Fed says, oh, we need a series of them. Well, I wrote an article yesterday in my Trading Places blog where I pointed out why I think this is starting the series. I think by the time we get to January, I think the series is going to be complete. And if you wait for the series to be complete and for the Fed to tell you that the series is complete, you're going to miss a big run up the stock market. That's why I think it's important to be in personally. Just my opinion. Everyone can do what they want to do. Um, anyway, I think things are looking much, much better on the NASDAQ, which is good. We needed the NASDAQ. We needed those growth areas. We needed the semis software, internet, we need those groups to start performing well. Some are doing better than others. Internet got a little bit of a late start, but starting to come back a little bit to life. Software doing a little bit better than internet. Semiconductors have been really on the move for about the last four weeks, if you haven't been paying attention. A very, very strong move up in semiconductors. I think we're getting to a key relative resistance area, a relative trend line that we're going to have to try to negotiate. Um, I think overhead resistance, like I said, we're going to have a, a number of areas to try to clear, but you don't go from underperforming to 52 week and all time highs overnight. It's going to be a process. And I think that process has started um, from a sector perspective. Energy was the leader on Friday. Wasn't technology, wasn't consumer discretionary. They were technology was a huge winner on Thursday, but we've still got some work to do in some of those areas. Uh, Friday, though, energy up, communication services up 2.6%, discretionary 2.4%, technology, big breakout here. This was actually an upsloping neckline that technology broke out, and you can see the shoulders 
were symmetrical. So this was a much better looking pattern. And we got the breakout. We got the confirmed breakout on the sector that is the most heavily weighted in the S&P 500 and, the, of course, the NASDAQ. That is a very bullish development for the stock market. Whether you're perma bear or not, if you can't recognize that breakout and the way technology is traded at the end of last week and the way it's been trading off the low in October, um, I don't know what to tell you. Healthcare uh, also uh, was actually one of the laggards along with utilities. Those two defensive groups on a relative basis did not perform well. They were both down on Friday. But look at healthcare. There's nothing wrong with this chart. This is part of the reason why we saw the Dow down on a, or well, it was up, but on a relative basis on Friday. Healthcare, industrials, financials, they didn't perform as well. You don't see them in the top four. Those were areas that have been in the top four over the past month, month and a half. And that's why we saw the Dow outperforming. So it was rotation. We saw a little bit of rotation. All right, 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, let me get the update here. So right now we're at 387. We are up four um, basis points. Um, not sure it's showing six basis points here on the, either way we're up. Bouncing off the 50 day moving average, that's the key. So we had this negative divergence right there, 50 day test. How about here? PPO coming down, price, the yield going up, negative divergence, 50 day test. Over here, slightly lower PPO, higher yield, 50 day test. Let's go back a little further. Right here, lower PPO, higher yield, 50-day test. I mean, I was talking about that back when we set this high, waiting. Remember, we were waiting for some sort of reversal back to the downside. We had a negative divergence in play. So we thought eventually we were going to get a 50-day test on the 10-year Treasury yield, which meant it would go down. What does that mean? It means growth areas are generally going to perform well. And that really came through on Thursday and Friday. Thursday, you can see that was when we made the big, big drop here. Lost the 20-day moving average. Now, here's what I'd be watching for in the 10-year Treasury yield, because I think the 10-year Treasury yield is going to be a very, very key barometer, both on what the Fed might do and what the stock market's going to do. I think the bond market's smarter than the stock market. I, like, I get a lot of my clues from the bond market. So here's what I'd be looking for. Number one, if we are beginning to start a downtrend on the 10-year Treasury yield. We should fail at that 20-day moving average, which right now is at 3.998. It's right at 4%, right there. If we can't move back up above 4%, if we fail and go back down and break down below the low that was established last week, I think we are, we are beginning a downtrend in the 10-year Treasury yield. And if that is the case, this two-day rally in growth stocks is not going to end, in my opinion. Watch the 10-year Treasury yield. Now, if we get back up above the 20, then I think we're looking at sideways consolidation. I think at that point, there's no clear winner. I don't know that we're going to break out. I don't know that we're going to break down. We've got to wait. That's what happens in sideways consolidation. Normally, in an uptrend, when you're followed by sideways consolidation, that's more of a continuation pattern, the odds are you get a breakout. So if you're asking me what the best thing is for the stock market, fail at the 20-day on the 10-year Treasury yield and come back down to a new low. So we're up a little bit. We got 12 basis points of room up to that 20-day moving average. I'd like to see that fail and then roll back over again. And there'll be a ton of economic reports out. I mean, we're not gonna get another CPI report until December 13th. We're not gonna get the Fed until December 13th, 14th, but the Fed will be talking as they always do. And they'll probably, they'll be trying to talk the market into whatever they wanna talk the market into. But we'll have some other economic reports, but can we hold that 4% yield resistance, that 20, day resistance. 
I think that's going to be key. All right, S&P 500, there's your breakout from last week. Huge move up. Volume was not light. Finished high both days near the, near the uh, high of the day. I think that's good. Does the market just go flying higher this week? I don't know. Could it? Yes. Could we have a big pullback? Yes, market can do anything at once. I believe this scenario has changed now from a downtrending market to one that was kind of stabilizing, starting to strengthen, to now a confirmed breakout. Short term, I'm talking right here. Short term uptrend is in play. And the thing you have to realize is that we're in this long term uptrend. So every time the short term turns up, I'm thinking it's turning up within the confines of this long-term secular bull market. This is a 100-year chart. This is 2013 breakout over this double top. And we have been in a secular bull market ever since. We had significant pullback in 2015, 2016. We had a cyclical bear market in 2018. We had a cyclical bear market with the pandemic in 2020. And we have had what I believe is another cyclical bear market in 2022 before we move up to set new all-time highs next year. That's what I believe. So for me, it's very important when I see the short term turn more bullish because now I'm swimming with the current. When you're in a short term downtrend or in a cyclical bear the problem is, yes, you're going lower, but you're going against the grain of the long-term secular bull market. When we break out, that changes. Just consider it. You may disagree with me, and that's fine. Market's got two sides, lots of bulls, lots of bears. If you're still bearish, you think we're in a bear market, and you think we're going a lot lower, trust me, you got a lot of people in your camp too. One side's going to win, one side's going to lose. You got to pick your poison. You got to pick whichever side you believe in. I believe we're going higher. Um, NASDAQ 100, also with the breakout above the 50 now. 20 is turning up. The big test on the NASDAQ and the S&P is on a pullback. Number one, the gap up that we saw. That's going to provide some really good support because of the massive volume that went with it. Normally, we see more volume on the way down than we do on the way up. And I know some of you are probably going to say, well, what about this volume here? That was bigger. And what about this volume? This was quad witching day. This was quad witching day. If you look at the third Friday of every, the, the uh, um, third calendar quarter of every, or third calendar month of every quarter, that's a lot of thirds, but the third calendar month of every quarter, look at the third Friday. It's quad witching. You have a ton of index options, contracts, everything falling due at the same time. And as a result, you get a lot more, you get a lot of volume those days. So here you go, December, there's March, there's June, and there's September. Take away those four days and tell me what the heaviest volume day of the year was of the last year. It was Thursday after a massive gap up. And then we kept going. A lot of gaps fill. You gap up and then you fail. This one we gapped with the heaviest volume of the year and kept going. There was a lot of buying. Price volume is number one. That's my number one indicator. Everything else, if you put me on an island and you said, okay, I'll give you a couple of things here. I want my charts with the candlesticks and the volume. That's what I want. That's number one. Just give me my candlesticks, give me my volume, and I can trade. That's the most important thing. Then we have secondary indicators that I use. And I'm going to talk about this for the next five minutes till the market opens because I'm getting a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Um, I'm getting questions on the videos I do. I'm getting questions from members. I'm getting questions on a lot of the stuff that I write. Um, and the questions are basically, 
What about your sustainability ratios? Let me start off explaining that price volume is always number one. That's my primary indicator. Nothing else is close, including sustainability ratios. If the stock market is breaking out, that is good. If the stock market is breaking down, that is bad. Start with that because most times that's going to be the most important thing you need to know. Are you trending up or are you trending down? The secondary indicators in the aggregate, when you add them all together, can start to tell you a story where you might not want to believe in what your price volume indicator is telling you. In January, when we were breaking out, there were a number of reasons why I was bearish, not just my sustainability ratios. That is an important part of this. So let me go up here and show you first. This is a weekly chart of the S&P 500. Here was the high. Do you see anything that might be a little suspicious when you look at the PPO? This is a weekly chart. As we went up the whole second half of 2021, trending higher, the PPO, the whole second half of 2021 was coming down. Negative divergence on the weekly chart. To start 2022, we printed a bearish engulfing candle. That is a reversing candle with a negative divergence in play. I wrote an article on December 31st. And one of the things I wrote in here, or one of the things I included in this article was the monthly performance of December, 2021. The defensive groups were leading that last rally. And if you study the stock market, that usually does not happen. Defensive groups lead when the market is weak. Aggressive groups lead when the market is strong. Consumer staples, real estate, utilities, and healthcare, those are the four defensive groups. And look at how strong they were in December. Well, let me go back to this chart. In December of last year, when we made this final run, we had a good run in the S&P in December of 2021 to all-time highs. Price volume, it was fine. I mean, you could say volume was light, but that's Christmas holiday week. Volume is always light. So another warning sign was the defensive groups leading throughout the month of December. Look at consumer staples up 10% and look at consumer discretionary up 0.15%. I, I don't believe I've ever seen a month where consumer staples outperformed consumer discretionary by 10 percentage points and did so with the S&P setting an all-time high. Wall Street's moving into defense. Why would they do that if the market's going to keep going up? These were warning signs. How about the equity-only put-call ratio? Anybody that's been following me for a while knows I started pointing this chart out back in January at Market Vision 2022. We had had so much bearishness, or excuse me, so much bullishness, in 2020 and 2021, that it pushed our five-day, or excuse me, our 253-day moving average of the equity-only put-call ratio down to this level. Since we began tracking this in 2004, we never saw anything like this. Everybody that could have thrown money into the market had thrown money into the market. When I evaluated the stock market at 2022, I said the biggest problem the stock market had was sentiment. I didn't say it was sustainability ratios. I said we needed to reset sentiment. Look at what we have done. Now we've got sentiment, which is probably back close to what it's been average for the last 18 years. Everybody's buying puts. That's great. Golf clap. That's what we wanted all year. We want, the, we want the stock market. We want everybody in the market to get bearish, to sell. 
That sounds harsh, but that's the way it markets bottom. When we bottomed in 2009, we bottomed when this ratio peaked. When we had a huge run-up starting in 2012, we did so when this ratio peaked. When we started, we started a little early here, but here we started in 2016 and we started a massive move when this ratio peaked. After we had a lot of choppiness here, this didn't give us a whole lot of signals, a little whipsaw. But from here, when we started turning up again, that was one of the reasons why I said we needed to reset. And the way you reset is through bearishness. You don't all of a sudden turn bearish if the market keeps going higher. The only way folks in the options world turns bearish is for the market to be weak, to do nothing or to go down. And that's what we did all year to reset this sentiment. So when we talk about sustainability ratios, understand their place in the hierarchy of whether a stock market's going up or down or whether something's sustainable. What I'm seeing with a lot of these questions is, and let me see if there's, try and come up with my ratios. So what a lot of folks are doing is they're saying, Tom, your sustainability ratio broke down. XLY, XLP broke down. QQQ versus Spider broke down. IWF, IWD broke down. The problem is you're going at it the wrong direction. I will be the first to tell you, I don't like it when that happens. But I use that to confirm the price breakdown on the S&P 500. Is the S&P 500 breaking down? No, it broke down back in early October. In early October, this ratio had not broken down. In early October, we were testing the low on this one, had not broken down. This one had not broken down. So as the ratios broke down because of the Fed, more than anything, these are growth stocks. They get hit with interest rates going up. The problem is, for the bears, is that as these areas were going down, what was leading in, in October? Industrials and financials, two other aggressive groups. Money wasn't leaving the market. Money was simply leaving those three groups. The overall market was strengthening. Anyway, I think all of this is part of a bottom. When you look at the market now, what did we talk about in early October? Positive divergence on the S&P 500. Not negative divergence like we had back here on the weekly chart. Now we had a daily chart that had positive divergence at that October low. Want to see the weekly chart at this low? Positive divergence. These are secondary indicators that are telling us a bottom is in. So the problem is folks that are lose, using the sustainability ratio and asking me questions now about the sustainability ratio aren't looking at the other secondary indicators, which are all turning bullish. So you're looking at one thing and you're trying to pigeonhole and look at one indicator and say, oh, market's got to go down because Tom's sustainability ratio is at a new low. That's not the way the market works. You're looking at it in reverse. Anyway, I wanted to spend some time on that because I'm getting a lot of questions and I can't respond to all of them individually. It's all about the stock market first, price action. What's the S&P doing? Number one, is it trending up? Is it breaking out? Well, it's breaking out in the short term. We got a lot of... I mean, when I talked about overhead resistance, we've got the 50-week moving average coming up. Positive divergence normally takes us to the 50-week, right? That's what I look for. It doesn't mean we're going to go through the 50-week. And when we get there, guess what we're going to hit? Trend line resistance. And then if we get through, what are we going to hit? Overhead resistance at 4,300, this price. And I think what we're going to see maybe is a bottoming head and shoulder. Reverse head and shoulder, left shoulder, neckline, head. I think we're going to go up. 
I think we're going to test that area 4,300 probably before year end. And then we're going to come back down, maybe print a right shoulder. Um, don't know exactly how far. I don't, I think probably the 20 week would be the furthest I would expect that to go, if even that far. And then I think we're going to get a breakout. That's what I think is going to happen. We'll see. But please, when you're looking at these secondary indicators, understand that they're just one secondary indicator. I didn't call the top based on the sustainability ratios. That was one of the indicators. We have a lot of things pointing to higher prices in the stock market right now. And you might, and I would agree with you, sustainability ratios are not one of them. They're, they improved last week, but they got some work to do. But all the other things that I look at are telling me the market's going higher. And as rates fall, the sustainability ratios will take care of themselves. Anyway, that's all I had for today. Um, let's take a quick look. I think the market was poised to open down. Let's see if it is down. Uh, yeah, we got the NASDAQ actually down 1%. So we're getting a little pullback for those who maybe missed or didn't get in on the Thursday, Friday run. If it were me, I can't make that decision for everyone. I'm not a registered investment advisor. I say it all the time. I am not licensed to advise anyone what to do with their money. And I am not advising anyone. I am telling you my opinion of the stock market, what I believe. I'll tell you sometimes what I'm doing with my money. But what you do with yours is completely up to you. I study the market. I try to pass along the things I've learned. And then it's up to every individual to do with it what they choose. They, you can disagree with me. You can agree with me. But what you do with your money is completely up to you. I like getting in on a pullback. And if we get close to that 20-day moving average, I will be probably pretty heavily into the leveraged ETFs. I will be aggressive. The closer we get to the 20-day moving average, the more I will be liking those uh, leveraged ETFs because I believe we are uptrending and a pullback's normal, especially after the week we had last week. Um, anyway, that's where, I, that's where I stand right now. We'll see what happens. By the way, look at the VIX now. Up 5% today, but at 23. It was 22 and change at the close on Friday. The other, a long-term signal that you're out of a bear market is that, that when that VIX dips below 17, watch 17. Historically, that's a very, very big level. Anyway, everybody have a great day. I'll be back tomorrow over at Stock Charts TV for your next episode of Trading Places Live. All you have to do is click on that at 9 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, and it'll bring you right in. Don't have to be a Stock Charts member. Have a, have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.